I know I've gone through trigger finger splints a lot, but it's always really great questions. And when it comes to trigger finger splints, you know that I go with the T pattern. So I'm gonna draw my T, oh, and not draw it like shit. Hold on, let me, <laughs> let me draw it out um, like a T. So normally I'll go like this, right? Obviously this is kind of big, but it's, it's a T pattern. And all it does is it goes and it should sit, I'm gonna draw my hand. It should sit pretty much below the PIP, right? And it should come down, let's see, around like this, right? So I'm just gonna draw it actually comes like this and then it comes like this to the other side all right so what it does is in the back when i do it it just touches right just it it touches it comes together like this but it doesn't overlap if it overlaps it can be a little bit bothersome or it might pinch them somehow so i like to have it just overlap now, if there's a little space in between, that's okay. But if the gap is really huge, then it might not fit nice and snug. I prefer to make one that does not have straps. That's just my preference. If you make it with a gap, then you have to put straps and like just make it a little bit longer so it goes like this. <laughs> All right. Uh, key thing is it's supposed to allow PIP and DIP motion. But when you fit it on somebody, it should fit them so it goes backwards a little bit. So when I fit them, I always push backwards like this. And then when it wraps around the, this MP part, it blocks them, right? So normally when I do it, it comes, it comes down and it should cross the distal palmar crease. If you stop your trigger finger splint, right on the distal palmar crease, then you're potentially creating more friction for someone and it's gonna irritate the shit out of them, right? If it's too long, then it gets into too much of the palmar aspect. So you've gotta find that spot that's just right based on your patient's functional ability, right? What they're doing, what they're using it for. This is a common one, this is a common one, this is a common, this one is actually a common one too. All of them except for the small finger. The small finger or trigger finger is not necessarily as common, it happens. So you can create something for that too, but it's, it's kind of hard to block this finger on the small finger. I can't remember the last time I did a trigger finger so on the small finger. I usually will do like a relative motion orthosis. Anyway, I'm getting beyond myself. So let's talk about what it looks like so if we do it on this finger and we do it on this finger, it's fine. Now we do it on to the um, index finger, kind of what happens is that um, it gets in the way of the thinner bar, I mean the thinner muscles, right? So normally if, I, if I'm talking about these and I want you to just kind of think about that, when I come down um, into the palm, sometimes, Sometimes I make it a little bulbous, right? So I make it kind of come out just a little bit wider to provide support. But if I do that kind of like bulbous shape, so if I kind of come out and do like a bulbous shape for the index finger, it's gonna get in the way even further. So if it's their left hand, it's not necessarily too much of a problem right if they're left if they're not left hand dominant if it's their dominant hand you then have to think about how they're using it and sometimes i'll make it a little skinnier on one side right so instead of it coming down so it's going to come down this way right and it's going to block here hold on it's going to block and now i'm going to 
draw on my hand this way, right? Um, and it's gonna come around, it's gonna come down. I might have to make it bulbous on the ulnar side, but make it a little skinny on the radial side. So a little bulbous on the ulnar side and a little straighter on the um, radial side of the finger, right? Because the thumb DNR is gonna get in the way. So the other thing outside of making it just slightly skinnier is how you're going to form it. So if I'm gonna form it and I'm gonna hold this one back, I might actually have it, the thumb coming in a little bit. So when I form it, it could kind of contour a little bit around the thumb. You see how thick my thumb muscle is, are, right? So if I were to form it, I'd form it so that this finger can still stay straight, right? Um, or a little bit further back, but I'd let the thumb fall forward into some opposition, right? So that when I form it, it's going to add like a little curvature to the thumb so that when that person goes to write, right? So I'm right-handed, so I'm showing you. So if they're writing, it won't get in the way of their thumb aspect. Because when you're writing, your index finger doesn't, doesn't flex all the way down, right? Look at how you're writing. If I'm writing, because we're making a we're making a trigger finger splint for somebody and they find it really tough to um, to function with it but they're triggering right here they're actually triggering here and here what we could do is we can make a relative motion but she doesn't like that because she can't type right that's fine you know, this is why it's important to know different skills. Um, so we can make one that is a little bit more up, but that her thumb goes around it pretty well, like curves around it. You can also potentially teach her how to write like this. This is a modified way of writing that doesn't require too much index finger. This actually requires less index finger. And uh, I'm sorry, this requires more index finger and in between um, requires less index finger. I don't know if she can fit a pen along with a splint, but I'm just saying, you can try it. Okay, so you when you mold it, you're gonna have it with the curve. So then when she's not opposing, there'll still be like that curve there. A little the bit, time. but the, yeah. So when you function? when you make that little curve, it's not like a big curve. It's just a little minor curve, <laughs> right? So it's just like if if um if we were going and saying like let's roll and flare out the end, right? So some people flare the shit out of it. It's like whoosh, you know, <laughs> and some people just do a little bit. So you can flare out as much or as little as you want. So you have to then do it and then see how it gets in the way of the writing and then practice in the way of the typing. It shouldn't get it. It shouldn't be that flare that's getting in the way of typing. So it's a matter of um, working that out because this is why it's custom. Okay, when you're doing your pattern, so you're cutting, how big should, the T B because that is one of my issues. Like I'm cutting it too big and then it overlaps or okay. I cut it too short and then it doesn't match. Like it doesn't um, close up enough. So how thick do I make my T? How tea? long does the T part have to so, be? Yeah. How long how long does the T part have to be? 
um, or how short. Like so let's, for example, say that, and I make my trigger splints out of scraps, all right? Scraps, what can I do with the scrap, right? I can't do it with this, but so you find your material. Like we save all our scraps because I think that it's important. You could do so many little splints with it, right? You could practice with it. So let's say I get a piece and I um, I cut. So that this is the way you can think about it. Is if I cut a really thick T, right? If I cut a really thick T, it can be shorter because I'm gonna stretch it, right? So if it's really thick, this T top is really thick, it can be shorter because I can stretch it. And one of the reasons why I kind of like to stretch it is because I look at how sensitive people are and if I stretch it a little bit, it makes my material just a little thinner, right? So if I use a really thick um, piece of material that I have that's scrap, I might make it real thick, and that way when I when I when I stretch it, it's gonna go like this. It's gonna come and not be as tall, and it's gonna uh, widen out. If I plan to not stretch it then I will make it however I need it to be, right? So then I don't stretch it. It's supposed to just loop around. Now, the great thing about working with a splint, and this go, this is with every splint that you can think of. The middle part, when you form it, is the most important part, right? That is the most important part because you can't change the middle. You can always change the ends. So if you made this too long, this bottom tee too long, you can trim it. Problem is don't over trim it because then it'll be too short. <laughs> That's why you need scraps to practice, right? You keep trimming and trimming and trimming, all of a sudden you're falling like, shit, I got no hair. <laughs> and you're like, oh my God, it's up on the door. You know, uh, just so crease. Um, so you've got to get really good at measuring it out with, I do it with my eyeballs. I said, oh look, <laughs> it needs to be this tall, right? It needs to be this long. So I, I measure it based on putting it on someone's hands, right? If you measure up to the PIP crease, it's always too long, all right? But you can cut your material and you could measure it out and you could trim the edges and you can make sure your corners are round, right? And then when you're ready to mold it, mold it, all right? And that's it. The key thing always to remember is on the top you can always trim on the top you can always roll down but you can't change the middle you can't once you once you fit it this part in between the fingers and stuff like that that one's harder to change right the top and the bottom can always be changed and the ends because you can easily dip that in and then just trim so it's just a matter of trimming enough, but not over trimming, All right? So when you're creating the trigger finger splint, keep in mind which finger you're doing it for so that you could make it fit that person. That person might need it to be a little bit bulbous at the bottom, right? A little like a little balloon bubble. Um, it might need to be for the index finger, just a little skinnier on one side, a little flared on the other side, and just a little flared, a little extra, you know, um, so that there's room for the thumb. 
and then you have them practice doing whatever it is that they're doing so they can feel comfortable and that they can use it. Splints only get used uh, when they're comfortable. When you're, when you're molding it, then just know that you always have to get the middle parts first and the ends are totally fixable. All right, do you need to show it? I don't think I need to show it. I've shown it like a million times. Should I show it again? I'll show it again. I can. I can show it again.